Ladies and gentlemen, Namaskar. Welcome to the 15th edition of Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol, Banega Swast India at the front lawn. This session is presented by Rajasthan Patrika. The festival brochure and flyer with details of the full program are available for purchase at the festival desk. We are delighted to introduce Boys Don't Cry, presented by Rajasthan Patrika. Award-winning author, journalist, and speaker, Meghna Pant's new gripping, gripping novel, Boys Don't Cry, takes its readers along the secret, sordid chambers of a modern Indian marriage. It is a thriller with intention, a horrifying reflection of a culture of gender and marital violence. The 200 million women abused in our country and also a striking message, a call for courage, conversations on mental health and the ending that every woman deserves. In conversation with novelist, psychotherapist and presenter, Lucy Beresford, Pant presents her gripping new work, The Threads of Gender, Power, Perspective, Freedom, Woven Together. Please welcome Meghna Pant. Meghna Pant is an award-winning author, screenwriter, journalist, and speaker who has been felicitated for a distinguished contribution to literature, gender issues, and journalism. She's the recipient of the Bharat Nirman Award, Frank O'Connor International Award, Commonwealth Short Story Prize, and Lardley Media Award. Her latest book, The Terrible Horrible, Very Bad Good News, will soon be adapted into a movie titled Badnam Laddu. Also, please welcome Lucy Beresford. Lucy Beresford is an award-winning writer, broadcaster, psychotherapist whose books have been translated into multiple languages. She's the author of three novels, Something I Am Not Invisible Threads and Hungry for Love, and a self-help book titled Happy Relationships at Home, Work and Play. Invincible Threads is set in New Delhi and was shortlisted for the Rubbery International Prize. Beresford is currently working on the book to film adaptation. We welcome you both, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you sitting in the audience. I love the fact that you're all sitting in the shade and no one's sitting in the sun, because of course that's where I would be, sitting in the sun, because we get no sun in London. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, I am absolutely thrilled and honored to be speaking with Meghna Punt. She is a heroine of mine, and not only is she an, a multiple award-winning author, she's a screenwriter, she's a journalist, she's a speaker, so we've got to give her lots of time to speak, but you're also going to have a chance to ask her some questions later on. So we're going to speak for about 30, 35 minutes, and then you can ask your questions from the floor. And we're both really looking forward to that bit as well. Not least because the subject of Meghna's latest book, Boys Don't Cry, brilliant cover, really eye-catching cover there, is a very important novel. It's funny, it's beautifully observed, it's got some fantastic characters, Manu in particular has a wicked sense of humor. I wonder where, I wonder where you might've got that from. But it is also touching on some really important areas of society, not just even in India, but around the world, along the lines of what happens when the perfect marriage from the outside is in fact poisoned within. We're talking about domestic abuse and the way in which it doesn't really get talked about at all. So I'm very pleased that there is a book out there now, a novel that we can read and, and really get a window on that. And also it's going to be a film through the production company Pocket Aces. So just tell me very briefly. Was sitting there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I love the production company already. Uh, how did that come about? Let, let's go to that bit first. How did the book to film adaptation come about? 
So thank you, Lucy, for that uh, lovely introduction. And I'm so glad that the book resonated with you. Uh, Boys Don't Cry has taken me 15 years to put together. Uh, it is the first time in my life that I've written something that's directly taken from my own life. I was previously in an abusive marriage and um, I stayed put for five years, despite my education, despite my modernity, despite my awareness and um, pulling myself out of it. First of all, identifying abuse because I didn't, uh, you laugh at this, but I, I didn't know that I was being abused. Uh, well, and that's then, gaslighting. That, gaslighting. I've been gaslit to such a great extent that I didn't, and you know, this. remember this was 14 years ago. We didn't know term, I didn't even know what gaslighting was back then. Um, I didn't know what uh, living with somebody with uh, mental disorder like bipolar or narcissism was like. Mm. So these were all, uh, unfortunately, these were the dark corners of life that Indian society never shone the light on. Um, so it took me uh, many years of healings. And then I started writing the book in 2014. And every time I'd start writing the book, I would break down. It was so overwhelming. I think finally, um, I really put it together when I was pregnant with my second child in 2019, 2020, I sat down and just wrote the book. And um, it's out there in the world. And within, I think, the second day of the book coming out on 18 January, I got a call from Pocket Aces, uh, the film company um, uh, known for very popular web series like Little Things on Netflix. Uh, they picked up the book. And uh, I'm very glad on Women's Day on 8th March, actually, we had our first writer's room meeting. So there's Karthik in the audience. He's flown all the way from Bombay just to support me today. So I know I'm working with the right people. Uh, and I'm, I'm dying for you all to see uh, the book on screen. And hopefully by next year, I'll be out there. And do you have an idea of who's going to play Manu? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we have many, <laughs> many, many contenders. Um, I, see, I think anybody, uh, we've thought of many names. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how many have anybody or any of you read the book by now in the audience? Hands up if you've read the book. And anyone you think would be a good Manu? I think Manika. Are there any favorite uh, film heroines from India who you like, who you think would be good? Deepaka Padukone? Yeah, Deepaka would be good. Absolutely. Not least because of the mental health angle. We know yeah. that she's done so much with her charity around that. Yes. So, yeah, if you're watching, Deepaka, uh, <laughs> get in touch. <laughs> We're on Instagram and Twitter, so you can uh, reach out to us directly. Uh, well, that is incredibly exciting news, but very well deserved because the book, the story, uh, it's it's so important. I want to I want to do a sort of deep dive into it. You said actually when you what you've just said that when you first tried to write it, because it is based on things that you went through, that actually it was all probably too overwhelming, too intense. What shifted then? What, what enabled you to finally think? What was it the pregnancy? Was there some sense in which I'm, I'm doing this for my uh, children? You know, by the time I was pregnant for the second time, uh, I already had a two-year-old daughter. And I would look at her and I say, I don't want her to lead the kind of life that I have led. And this is despite my privilege and or, or education and all of that, because what's happening is Domestic abuse, one in every three women in India is a victim. That means 200 million women. And by the way, abuse doesn't have to mean physical abuse. That's what people get mistaken. It can be emotional abuse, which is the biggest form of abuse. Uh, for me, I think 90% of my marriage was emotional abuse. Uh, I was stripped of all my sense of self. I was, despite my... Uh, I have been raised to be a very strong uh, woman. My mother's a very strong, it's her, my mom's 70th birthday today, by the way. Happy and uh, she's the strongest woman I know. So, you know, please, thank you. Uh, I think my mom will be so happy. Mom, this book is for you. Um, she was really a support system when I was trying to get out of uh, um, the marriage as well. And this is the lady who, by the way, it's from the time I was 20 years old, kept telling me to get married. And when I said, Mama, this is not working out for this, these many reasons, she was also the first person who said, leave this guy. And I will be there. Nobody else was by my side and she was by my side. Oh, my god! So goodness. hats off to her. So this book is wow. dedicated to my mom. She's 70 today and the strongest, smartest, bravest woman I know. Um, and yet, despite all of that, yeah. despite coming from that kind of family where that having a strong woman as a role model is instilled in you there's something about domestic violence domestic abuse and as you say it doesn't have to be physical and in fact the the character in your novel the the husband Sunit says 
No, no, domestic abuse is where you end up in the hospital. Have you ever ended up in hospital? Therefore, you have not been abused, yeah. which again is what this sort of gaslighting topic that we've talked about. Gaslighting is a term that comes from a, a play in the 1940s where the husband was surreptitiously turning down the level of gaslight. And the wife would say, why is it so dark in here? And he was saying, sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. Why, what, what are you talking about? No, the, the lights are just as bright as they've always been. So in English, the term gaslighting means that sort of very psychological manipulation. What sort of things did you experience that have gone into this book? So many things. The first thing was the, the guy hit me two weeks before our wedding. No. And I still got married and I keep saying this, we need to take away that, you know, the big fat Indian wedding, right? Yeah. It sounds very grandiose. It sounds very uh, exciting. But the fact is you're putting so much pressure on the woman who's getting married that she simply can't cancel her wedding. And I keep telling people, stop, parents, especially in India, stop wasting your money on saving for your daughter's wedding. Save it for her dreams instead. Save that money and put it into a company that she wants to start or if she wants to go uh, to Harvard and study or, you know, she wants to be the CEO of her own company, whatever it is, or help her buy, uh, for, pay for the down payment for her first flat. So invest it in things that will, you know, empower the girl, not suppress her and let her then pay for her own wedding, you know, empower her so much that she can pay for her own grandiose wedding. So I think I wish that conversation would also change. But the fact is that my parents at that time in 2007 had spent lakhs on my wedding and I didn't have the guts to cancel that. I mean, thousands of people had been invited. How do you then turn around and say that, Acha, ab, you know, like cancel the wedding because uh, I, I think the guy hit me, but he's saying he's not hit me. And it was just a little fight he had and he just happened to lose his temper. And he said that I retaliated. That means I hit him. So, you know, Real mind games. Real mind games. And you don't know what you, you're like, but I, I'm not the sort of person who you know, finds myself in these kind of situations. Yeah. But the fact is when someone has, uh, an abuser is a very, very smart person. And the mind games that you speak about, they're much better at it than we are. You know, I've never, I'm, I've always been a very straightforward person. What you see is what you get. So I, it took me a while to even identify that these are mind games that were being played, not just by the guy, but also by his parents. And because I'd left my country, I'd, I live in Mumbai, I'd left Mumbai, I'd left my job at NDTV uh, to go be with the guy, I'd gone to New York City, uh, I was kind of all alone. So the one thing that the abuser will do is they'll try to isolate you. Then that guy, of course, happened to hate my family, happened to hate all my friends. So, you know, he was further isolating me. And my entire life for those five years was only him and his parents and his stepbrother who lived five minutes away. So I think these are all the typical signs of abuse. And the reason I'm talking about it is because I didn't know all this. You know, this is all awareness. I have seen now on the hindsight, like I'm aware of it now because I have 14, 15 years of reflection. But for if you have a daughter, if you have a sister, uh, you know, if you're a woman yourself, or even a man, by the way, a lot of men wrote to me when I first wrote about this in Femina in 2015, I think. I wrote an article about this. You will not believe it. There were thousands of messages I started getting. Wow. And women around India, there was one actress, I will not name her. She called me up and said, Meghna, uh, my actor husband, theater actor husband, threw me out of a moving car. <gasps> uh, a dancer uh, messaged me on Facebook and she said, Meghna... Um, uh, my boyfriend broke my spine and I can't dance anymore. Uh, and these were just, it was like an outpouring of messages. Women have not been allowed to express what they're going through. Even today, by the way, every one in every three of you has undergone some sort of abuse and you've not even been able to talk about it to anyone because well, you're so ashamed. Taboo. You're ashamed. And people told me also, they're like, nay, nay, ek se taali nahi bachti, which means you must have provoked him. That's right. I, I deserved to get hit. Victim blaming. Yes. And it's so common, even in uh, uh, what in instances of rape in our country. In, in, I grew up in an India where if you walked down the road and a guy molested you, it was your fault. Mm -hmm. Why did you wear sleeveless top? Why did you wear red? I was told once that lal kapra kyu pehna hai. Obviously, uh, ladke tumhe chuenge. You know, like why did you wear red uh, cloth? Obviously, your, the boys yeah. will be attracted to you. They're like bulls, and obviously they'll touch you then. Yeah. Or you know, why are you wearing your short skirt? <laughs> Yeah, I see people clapping, but this is, you know, the mentality. And I was told that I am to be blamed for getting molested. Women in India are blamed for getting raped. We're blamed for everything bad that happens to us. 
Mm. So what is domestic violence is just one of those other things. And your book is shining a light on that really sad situation. As you say, I, I remember a slut walk in Mumbai where people were holding placards saying my dress is not a yes. That actually just because I'm dressed in a particular way or because of my gender. The interesting thing is that there is sort of, you know, gender alluded to in your title, Boys Don't Cry. How much, how important is that bit the belief system of society that men are not allowed to have vulnerabilities, that they're not allowed to express their emotions, that they've actually got to be this sort of much more macho person. How much of that is also being addressed in your book? So uh, thanks for that question, Lucy. And I think it's a very important question. A lot of you have been asking, Migna, why boys don't cry? You know, what does the title have to do with the book? And the fact is uh, that what we do is we we are, I think, patriot. You know, people keep telling me, Megna, you're a feminist. I wrote this book called Feminist Rani, and I was asked this question a lot. Ki, why are you a feminist? And feminism is a bad word, and you should not be associated with it, and don't make it public. And I said, but this is the mistake we're making. Feminism is not men versus women. I don't hate men. The strongest role models in my life are my brother, my father, my husband, right? I don't hate men at all. It's not about men versus women, but men and women versus patriarchy, a system that has been unjust to both genders. What we do, what do we do when boys are born? We tell them, Roma, don't cry. We put them into these little boxes and we stereotype them that they're not allowed to be vulnerable. They're not allowed to be sensitive. They're not allowed to wear pink. They're not allowed to be a dancer. They're not allowed to cook. What is this nonsense? We're putting little boys into these boxes and, and uh, doing them, we're dehumanizing them. We're doing them such a disservice. So I think patriarchy is something that we all need to come together. Uh, irrespective of our gender and fight against and let the boys also break out of that. We keep having conversations on women. And I'm seeing now, aren't we a much stronger society for women now as we were compared fi to five years ago? We are. But where are the 200 million adolescent boys? We're leaving them behind in the conversation because we're focused on women. I'm very happy for women and women should be stronger and emancipated. But let's not forget that it, we, it's not about uh, us being versus men. We have to take boys and men along with this. It's a collaborative effort. It's a collaborative effort. And it's also important in society. And I thought there was a lovely uh, moment um, in your novel where Manu, the heroine, discovers that her husband has been emailing the mother-in-law. Uh, and we, we all know how we feel about mothers-in-law but there is a very particular dimension to this which is the sense that your heroine gets in that moment of quite how many odds are stacked against her this actually isn't about just her and Sunit her husband this is actually about the whole system and I thought that was a, that using the emails in that way was a really clever way of getting that across that if you if you try to fight the husband you are going to be up against all these other people who say, well, that can't possibly be happening. He loves you. He, look how well he provides for you. So what were you trying to do in that bit? What, what, what sort of other messaging were you putting across there? Um, first of all, those emails are called the eek mails, right? Yeah. And they were true. I still have those eek mails in my uh, Gmail inbox, unfortunately. In fact, they, they, they were a good thing at the end of it in retrospect because it helped cut me. The cord, the Megan, I cut the cord, Megan. <laughs> cut the cord. <laughs> Got to let go sometime. <laughs> Because it gave me so much material for the book. I was going right? to say, Searches you've written the book now, yeah. so you can cut, <laughs> cut the cord. Uh, no, but it gave me so much material for the book because I'd yeah. forgotten a lot of instances. But I think that moment, uh, you know, people keep asking me, Meghna, why would somebody like you put up with abuse for five years? This is one question that I've been asked by a lot of people. Uh, first of all, I think when you're in love with somebody, when you poured your whole self into someone, you keep hoping for them to change, right? Because you can't imagine that you've chosen someone who can turn out to be so evil or who can turn out to abuse you. You don't, that's not why we fall in love. Those are not the reasons we look for when we are falling in love. Um, so I think that, that identifying that I had made a mistake took me very long because this idea of perfection also that, you know, in our country, we say ki, you're a women are devis, right? Yeah. Uh, which means we are goddesses. And there's a problem with that also, because if you're putting women up on a pedestal, then admit it, for them to admit failure becomes very difficult. And divorce is the most public of all failure, right? You can uh, rape someone, you can murder someone, but and nobody can fi will find out, may not fi find out. But if you divorce someone, the whole world will find out, right? So it's one failure that you can't, you have to come out in public with. 
So this idea of perfection that I had also been raised with that, Acha Meghna, you're a great friend, you're a good sister, you're a good daughter, uh, you're good at your work, you're good at this, you're good at that. That idea of imperfection, that honestly, I'm telling you very honestly here, it took me a very long time to come to terms with my own imperfections. Mm. And now I know that we're all as humans fundamentally flawed. That is our life experience. We're sent down here to make mistakes, to fall and to fail. And we fail every day more than we succeed every day. Mm. But it's taken me very, very long to come to terms with that, to embrace myself with all my kinks and all my flaws and all the odd things that make me who I am today. And I, I, even, you know, I keep talking about the superwoman. I think the superwoman is the villain of the feminists because again, you're putting so many expectations on women that you have to look like Deepika Padukone, you know, the one you just mentioned. You have to earn like Indira Nui. You have to, you know, cook as well as uh, Vikas Khanna, whatever. There's so many expectations even today on women. So I think that idea of perfection, forget what society is saying. Let society, uh, right? Opinions are like armpits. We can uh, avoid them. But your own sense of self, that, you know, it's okay for me to make mistakes, to fall, to fail, to be a flawed human being. That took me a very long time because at that time, people used to say that if you're divorced, you're either like, there's something very wrong with you, that you're a crazy person or you're a difficult person. And I was like, but I think I'm a decent human being. So why is something like this happening to me? I know much worse human beings who are in great marriages. <laughs> So why do well, I think about marriage. marriages? We don't yeah. know what goes on behind closed doors. Exactly. We never know. I mean, I think that is another really almost chilling aspect of the book is the sense that it's, it is a window on a marriage and, and we don't get to see that. None of us really get to know what any of our friends' marriages are like, or even our parents, even when we grew up with them, we can often be told things later in life. And you're thinking, how did I not know that? You know, I grew up under the same roof. How important was it for you that the character of Sunit, the, the husband, has some mental health issues uh, or actually that mental health is part of the equation because there would be some people who would argue that domestic violence is, is just an evil in its own right, that it doesn't have to be pegged to mental health or any of the other issues. What, what would you say to that? I would not agree. I think it's all tied in very deeply. Um, you know, I, for me, I think that moment, um, I was talking about falling in love, but I think we need to also talk to people. We, we learn so much about falling in love through our movies, through literature. Uh, and we, we identify so much with it that we even know we can identify the exact moment we fell in love with somebody, especially somebody we choose as a life partner. But we never talk to people about how to fall out of love. Right? We are you supposed, is it a moment that you fall out of love with somebody or there's several moments? Do you take a piece of yourself out or do you take your whole self out? Because when we fall in love, we suddenly pour our entire selves into that other person, right? So how do you withdraw from that love? How do you take it away from yourself and from that other person? So I think these were all the things that I was, I, I was trying to talk about, but that moment that for me really came was when I started sleeping with a knife under my pillow. And I think that was when all that gaslighting and my abuser and his family told me Ki, Meghna, you're not being hit because same thing that you didn't end up in the hospital it's not like you have scars or bruises to prove that you've been hit so it was very carefully constructed the entire abuse uh, the anatomy of abuse if I have to look at it was very carefully curated very carefully constructed uh, to make me believe that I was not being abused and I was told the same thing that uh, thappar to lagte rehte har shadi mein, that every single marriage has abuse in it it's just that nobody talks about it as if that justifies it. But that's what I was told, ah. can you imagine? Yeah, so, but when I started sleeping with an, and I kept thinking maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not. It's know. the self-doubt. Yes. You, you talked just now about the perfectionism. And I think that is partly what makes it hard to walk away. But unfortunately, I think the other thing that happens in abusive relationships is that one's sense of self gets ground down so much that you do doubt yourself. You just, even having a knife under your pillow doesn't ring. If I, you know, obviously I wrote that down, that would be a red flag for most people. Yes. But when it's happening to you, it's been so invidious, yes. so gradual. That yes. self-doubt must have really eaten away before you could rebuild yourself. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, we keep talking about the perfect perpetrator, you know, the prototype of a perpetrator, but there's also this prototype of a victim, 
that a victim must be like this sort of, uh, you know, uh, sad, sappy person who can't stand up for herself. But I'm not like that. I'm a strong, powerful woman. And I hit back. I gave it back to my abuser. So I was not that prototype of a perfect victim. You know what I'm saying, right? And I didn't, therefore, I didn't, I didn't think of myself as a victim because of that. So it, it was very complicated, but I think that night, uh, so my first novel, debut novel, One and a Half Wife, uh, I was living in Dubai at that time with my perpetrator. I had launched it um, in uh, 2012. And that was a night when I got, uh, sorry, uh, but I got my periods that night and my abuser did not let me access my sanitary napkins. No. And then he had a countdown. <laughs> and actually, when I begged him for it, he let me enter that room and then started counting down five minutes. And I think that was the night I was just like, oh my goodness. Why would I, you're the, treating me worse. The power trip of that. I mean, that, that whole scene yeah. does get relayed in the book, but it just speaks to the power dynamic that is all about domestic abuse. And there, the, the most incredible thing is your revenge, if I can call it that, is your is your success it, everything that you do it, your but it's probably more than that yeah it is revenge just because you've shown him yeah. how you survive without him that that's the key goal I think and and that's why we're so proud of you and so in awe of what you've done that's why the book is so important and we speak you and me um you and I are speaking a couple of days after the International Women's Day uh, certainly in the UK, there were one or two articles uh, asking why there isn't an International Man's Day, uh, which tells you all you need to know about why there is an International Women's Day. How important do you think a book like yours is for, for a whole generation of people who, who need to know that life could be different for women? Uh, so we were just joking about this earlier that, uh, you know, a lot of men were complaining about Women's Day, but we are like, every day is Man's Day. So can you let us have one day in the year at least? But I I'm sorry, talking about this book still makes me so emotional. It makes me so angry sometimes because uh, even in the book, I almost, I almost want to kill myself. And if you'd known me earlier, if you know me as a friend or even as a person, I am not the type of person to do something like that, to inflict self-harm upon myself. But if somebody can push you into a corner so much that they drive you to suicide and then you put up with it still, it still makes me so angry that I let someone do that to me. And I always say now for women and men, by the way, please fight for the love that you deserve because you will only get the kind of love you deserve in your life. So please stand up for your love. You deserve it. And if it's only self-love, if it means you have to be single for the rest of your life, embrace that. The biggest and most important love is self-love. And by the way, now I'm married to a wonderful man, a very gentle, kind. <laughs> Thank you. It really, it, trust me, I really made him uh, run around chasing me for many years before I could gather the courage to say yes to another person and you know, get married again. But I have two beautiful little girls. Um, and I, I think I've got the happiness I deserve. Uh, in my professional life, great, but also in my personal life, I think that that beauty has come in, uh, you know, that I think I really, I think I had to really suffer for my happiness, but I'm glad I did because now I'm a happier person in a different way. And I'm very grateful for every single moment of success or happiness that I get. I embrace it. Um, but I would say that for everybody that, you know, please, please fight for the love that, that you deserve. And the reason I wrote this book is not to just talk about my story, but to give that message of hope and that redemption. So by the way, kill off the guy. <laughs> It's right up top of the book, so I'm not giving away the end. And I do some other stuff. So I get my revenge and I get my redemption and I get my closure. And, and you get your self-respect. You get your self-respect. And that's yeah. why I say never mess with a writer. You cannot be able to mess. <laughs> we'll write an entire book about you, so do not mess with us. But I mean, jokes aside, honestly, I think uh, it's a message of hope and redemption that if someone like me who was driven to suicide by her perpetrator, if I can sit and fight back like this, and I can write a book and I can even kill the guy uh, in the book, you can do it too. So always fight for your happy ending, no matter what, how fraught that journey is, how difficult the challenge seems, fight for your happiness and always, always fight for yourself and trust your gut. I kept doubting that I'm being abused. Please don't do that to yourself. If you see any red flag, flags, if you, see, if you feel uncomfortable with anything, 
please trust your inner voice please trust your gut instinct even you know uh, aspiring writers by the way they keep saying ki but why will anybody want to read my book and i always say please trust your dreams trust your voice so no matter what you do whether it's in your job or your personal life always go with your inner voice always trust your gut trust your instinct it'll never do wrong by you yeah and also that again respect is so important that the moment that you decide to leave the moment where it, all those pieces fit together the knife under the pillow or the other memories that you have is the moment of great self love that's the gift that you're giving yourself of your future and in a way we don't want anyone who's here today or who's watching this online to ever feel that they don't deserve that amazing future but they do it's it is about treating Tr treating yourself i suppose seriously in the way that you would a friend um i also do love the fact that your character as you can tell from magna's conversation manu is is a very very whip smart funny character how important was it for you to bring humor into what is fundamentally quite a heavy could be a heavy subject it isn't in your book it's it's beautifully written but humor is part of that and it's a really good foil what what choice did you make around that you know i i don't know how many of you know that my brother saurabh pant the stand up comedian and we've been raised by a very funny man my father deep chandra pant he's uh, i think we grew up surrounded by a lot of laughter uh, my father has a joke for every occasion i mean so i grew up in a family where we were literally raised not to take life too seriously because none of us get out of it alive so that's the mantra i've been raised by that don't take anyone or any situation too seriously so i think that humor everybody keeps talking whenever somebody says a book is uh, funny or humorous I, i'm a little taken aback because i think in my writing i'm not purposely trying to be funny but i think i do have that dark humor so i think it comes out inevitably because that's just my world view that's just the way i think or the way i uh, process situations but trust me i think writing has been a form of healing it's therapy it saved me from literally i think it's it's been my savior the reason i am today is because of my writing and also because of my humor so if if you can do that as well because you know we're all going to face tragedy and setbacks in some form shape or the other in our entire lives so i think taking a step back and evaluating it with a slightly lighter lens whether it's with your friends family or even within your that inner voice that we all have i think that really helps the process thing and also you've described something that's very therapeutic which is the writing down because people nowadays do talk about journaling you know if you're feeling something to actually journal it but the reason why that's so powerful is not just you get it out but it's there you can't say oh i forgot or i'll suppress that because it's there and if you flick back through your notebook it was all there i suppose as i said just now your your book also deals with with um mental health it deals with the place of women in society and i was wondering where you think india is in terms of gender parity really but also one of the reasons why i think the book is so effective is that actually this isn't just an india story this is about men and women or this is about it doesn't even have to be heterosexual relationships it could be same sex relationships where there's a power imbalance someone is going to get hurt where are we in those conversations then why are people not talking about this uh i don't know how many of you heard the shadow pandemic right uh which is basically that um domestic abuse during the pandemic has gone up exponentially uh, i think it was almost 300% in certain countries so this is definitely not an india problem uh domestic abuse is prevalent across nations across the world in the uk they had had big posters saying the domestic abuser always works from home so we had a work from home policy during the pandemic and that that was the way to get across the fact that yeah. it's hard it's it's tough but uh again i'd say uh you know the one thing i think women have to do or even men who are being abused by the way a lot of men also wrote to me and they were very upset that i titled this boys don't cry because they said but we do cry <laughs> and i know of that and i also know of guys who've been abused uh one a friend of mine told me that uh his girlfriend had hit him with a hot kettle across his face so it's not just it's not just women it's also men who face abuse and the problem is it's so sad that men because they've been dehumanized and desensitized they've been told that you're not allowed to express your emotions you're not allowed to show your vulnerability boys are in a even more difficult situation because they can't talk about this at all people will make fun of them if they say that my girlfriend or my wife hit me 
So it's not just women, it's also men who are not able to talk about domestic violence or abuse in any form or shape. So let's remove this taboo. Let's remove this, you know, even today, you know, if, if we hear of a case of violence, do any of us really step in? We're like, no, it's a private issue. It's between a guy and his, his lady or, uh, you know, between a family. Who are we to interfere? Why should we interfere? How will this help us in any way? You know, it's literally like we are, we're watching a truck hurling down at someone and we're not moving them out of the way because we've assumed such a wide distance between us and abuse. So stop making this such a private matter. I have not written this book so that I can wash my, you know, dirty laundry in public or air my grievances. I've written this book so we can take the conversation forward with a message of hope that you can fight back and you should fight back. So, you know, slap back, clap back, fight back. So open, and I'm not saying go in on a public platform like this or go on Twitter or write a book. I'm not saying all that. Just acknowledge what you're going through. Admit it to yourself. And then get out of the site of violence. Remove yourself from that site of violence. Remove yourself as far away from a perpetrator as you can. And heal yourself. Take out that time. And in that process of healing, no matter what it takes of you, whether you want to go and have multiple sexual conquests, you want to go travel the world, you want to quit your job, you want to write a diary, Whatever you do in the process of healing, do not apologize for it because you have apologized enough for your existence with your abuser. With your abuser. So heal yourself, assume a wide distance and seek help in the way that it works for you. And trust me, you will find your happiness. There is you know, a rainbow at the end of that very, very dark tunnel. And if I am smiling here today and laughing and coming up on stage, it's been 15 years, it's taken me that many years, a decade and a half to be able to do this. But if I can do it, so can you. So Amazing. please remember that. And as Meghna says, we need to keep the conversation about these topics going. So I now open the floor to people who might have questions, who I know have questions, hands going up already. Uh, uh, who's got the microphone though? Oh, okay. So we are getting a microphone. If you've got a particularly loud voice, I will choose you first. <laughs> I can hear you because you're in the front row. That doesn't count. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thanks for saying the, uh, the boys are abused as well. As a boy, I was abused sexually as well as uh, physically. Sorry, physically. And at the age I'm of... I'm so sorry. Yeah. At the age of 67, I wrote my experiences like a small little um, uh, story like that. And I published in my Facebook page and also uh, to some groups that I'm uh, active in the Facebook, I mean, in WhatsApp. So thank you for saying that because that really relieved me a lot because this actually carries away. Now I have a feeling that uh, now whenever you are making an application form, there is your name and your father's name, then there's a sex part. Why should we have that? Because I want to feel that everybody is human being. I mean, like everybody is a person, uh, not as a uh, female or male. Now they added other because then they realized, you know, because the, 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 the other gender people, they're also coming out like, you know, that we also have rights and things like that. So why don't we work towards that? You know, we can, we can do without this as a person. What do you think yeah, about good it? Good question. I think gender is a social construct anyway. So yeah, very good point. And thank you for speaking up and, you know, normalizing this conversation, even for your gender, because I think that's very important. So hats off to you, big round of applause. <laughs> yeah. Next question. Yes. Just have somebody raise hands before you. This you see, now the concept has changed. Uh, whenever the females are born, the allied families and uh, more than medium families, they just celebrate the birthdays, anniversaries and all that. But uh, in the poor families and uh, below average families, still their mindset is not uh, of that uh, modern. How you can change their mindset? What precisely you want to suggest to the government? Okay, how it can be done so as to change their mindset? I think beti padhao, beti bachao is the only way. The only way for women to achieve uh, independence in life is to be financially independent. The only way to achieve financial independence is through education. 
so that's only even i have so many uh, so many women who come to me domestic help right domestic workers in india the women have come to me and said my husband is useless he's an alcoholic he's abusive and she's a sole uh, bread uh, winning member of the family but she's still putting up with abuse and i've never understood that that you're financially the you know breadwinner but you're also at the same time you know the bringing home the bacon a, and that, also cooking the damn thing and is that a stigma thing is that because they again there's still what you were talking about earlier the way in which divorce is still seen as a bit of a failure and that if you're the woman that must be your fault as well so you've got that double double whammy of the failure i think it's also this uh, i know marriage is very sacrosanct and i consider it extremely sacred but i think we put too much emphasis on the institution so you know back in 2012 when i got divorced it was a it was still kind of taboo but now you know in bombay at least in mumbai where i live every second person is getting divorced and nobody bats people on the third and fourth uh, marriages and nobody cares so i'm glad we've taken away that taboo from uh, from you know divorce that it's okay if you're not happy then uh, move out of the marriage but i think again uh, we need to move forward as a society because at least in certain strata divorce or breaking up a relationship is still considered bad it still reflects badly on the women my divorced male friends find it easier to move on to get remarried or to uh, have relationships than my uh, female divorced friend so there is still an inherent bias in our society and of course i know i belong to a certain segment of society where these uh, where people are quite liberal they're unconventional but i know in conventional like sir mentioned in the poorer families it's still a taboo so yes uh, while we're taking ourselves along let's also take our entire gender entire nation and remember if we change as individuals that's how a family will change right it all begins with us people are like megna why should we speak up because how will our voice matter your voice matters you change as an individual then your family will change if your family will change then your neighbors will change your society will change that's how your nation will change and that's how the world will change it begins with you so don't underestimate your own individual voice wow um beautiful answer just just uh, we have about 5 to 7 minutes so do you want to take two three questions together and then answer them if that's okay yeah 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 okay and i would just request the audience members to keep them as questions kisi ladki se bhi puch lo ha bilkul ab wahi karenge we have three okay okay ma'am uh first of all i'm really proud of you i really am and i want to know how are we supposed to outsmart the gaslighter like when we are so in love with the other person we tend to ignore the negative sides of that other person and we just focus on the bright side so that our sanity remains intact so how are we supposed to outsmart the gaslighter in that way um that's a very good question thank you for asking that i'm the worst person to ask that too because clearly i couldn't do it <laughs> but i don't know would you know something better about this i i would say that it is very much about self knowledge and what i mean by that is at at that deeper sense of of knowing that something is is not quite right and and in a way that's what megna was talking about when she talked about how we throw ourselves into relationships because we love someone so completely and we put them on a pedestal if we do that we often lose a great sense of ourselves of what makes us who we are and what gives us grounding and i think it's possibly only possible to leave the abuser once you begin to to re uh put yourself together so that you haven't given everything away to the perpetrator but you start to reclaim that you reclaim your interests your passions your family your friends your work because of course that is going to be quite threatening to the person who's gaslighting you but that's the only way they're splitting you up into fragments and you need to reclaim that make yourself whole and only then can you stand up to them and and say this this is not acceptable and there are some relationships the gaslighter will have had relationships in the past where they weren't able to get away with their dirty tricks because someone would have turned around and said well that's ridiculous i'm not i'm not staying with someone who doesn't give me my tampons every once in a while yeah. but for other people it's it's too difficult to do that so you've got to reclaim yourself first get that self respect back and as megan has pointed out has has demonstrated it is possible and i think trust your gut instinct again i come back to the same point that if something is feeling wrong that means it's wrong at least it's wrong for you so and don't ask other people's opinions if you're feeling yeah. internally that something is just off like i asked so i spoke about it finally to a couple of my close friends 
And they're like, they say the same thing that Meghna, if you didn't end up in the hospital, if you don't have any scars, we don't see any bruises on you, then how are you being abused? Maybe you provoked him, maybe you asked for it. And therefore that self-doubt made me stay on to the person for five years. So if your gut instinct, if your inner voice is telling you Ki, something is wrong, please trust it. And I always tell people like as a writer, when I'm writing, I'm supposed, I'm very emotional, right? I'm putting up a story down. The minute the story is out there in the world, like in the form of a book, then I leave my emotions aside and then you're supposed to become a business person so that you can sell more books, right? <laughs> so you're tapping into that emotional and unemotional side of yourself in order to be a writer. I say the same thing of relationships, that there's a time to be emotional and there's a time to be practical. So be emotional, it's fine when you're falling in love and all of that. Please, by the way, please, date, when you're dating somebody, please date his family, his or her family as well. Yeah. That's a very important part of the whole process. So you don't find yourself <laughs> in situations like this to begin with. I know, and even if you're getting an arranged marriage, please, I beg of you, go and date, they take the mother-in-law, future mother-in-law out for, you know, coffee or whatever. Please date the entire family and see how the guy is treating the women in his family. I think that's a dead giveaway. But at the end of it, it's all about yourself. We are all alone in this world, right? We are born alone. We're going to die alone. Fall in love also. Think of it as something you're doing alone. And when you're falling out of love also, it's only you. So trust your voice. And also there are just on that note, because the very specific question is, what can you do? There are definitely some sentences that should ring some alarm bells. When you say, if, if your perpetrator says, oh, I was only joking, or why are you so sensitive? Or the real killer is... Um, oh, you're the only person that winds me up this way. Everyone else thinks I'm great. Or my friends all think you're crazy too. If they say any of that, you have to leave. Uh, and you have Megna's and my permission to do that. Uh, We've been asked to helps. wrap up, guys. I'm yeah, so we have. Sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> but uh, Megna is going to be signing copies of Boys Don't Cry in the author's tent, I think, which is just kind of the yellow tent Behind. opposite. Yeah. Uh, so if you've got other questions for her, uh, but you'll also find her around the the, um, the festival, you can speak to her then. But uh, it just remains for me to say what an honor it has been to have such a lovely, juicy conversation about uh, Meghna Pant, her life, and her gorgeous new novel, Boys Don't Cry. Please thank her. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Lucy, for such uh an elucidating conversation and uh, guys please take the conversation forward don't let you can forget me you can forget the book you can forget the session but please take the conversation forward wish you all the best thank you and i'll be signing books over there if anybody wants signed copies and at the bookstore later thank sure. you thanks we'd like to thank Meghna Pant and Lucy Beresford along with Rajasthan Patrika for their support we know there are a lot of buzzing questions that we have in our audience. Megna's going to sign the book in the author signing lounge right behind the front lawns. And you guys can also take your questions there.